the bars indicate the crop response, the gold bars uh, for corn and the green bars for, for um, soybean. And some things we see here, it takes a number of years for the lime to really work and ne adequately neutralize the soil pH to have an effect. But we're seeing a response here already in the third year with the corn and then a big response in the fourth year with the soybean. We see also that the responses tend to be greater with the soybean, including last year, and that was the biggest response at all, uh, of all. And that was just with the one application done in 1995. Uh, with corn, the response has been more erratic. With the lines, we look at the economics. So with the red line was the cost, and at that time about $44 per acre for the purchase of the lime to transport the application. There is some interest cost until payback, and then once it's payback, then we level it off. Uh, the blue bar is, blue line is the gross returns, and that includes a 6% per year earning on this, the, the profit. So start, starting here, there was a 6% effect, but most of it is uh, uh, because of increased crop yield. This was done with $8. Um, soybean and four dollar corn and then this is the net profit up over three hundred fifty dollars because you're using light to fix that co2 so your job is managing both light and water for your crop now we'll just take a look at the water part first if you take a look at the estimated et which stands for evapotranspiration on a daily basis it starts out low in the beginning of the season peaks around just before a pod along the age and then declines again the middle of the season, about right now perhaps, you're throwing off about three-tenths to a third of an inch per day. Everyone, anybody know here how many gallons are in an acre inch of water? Twenty-seven. Ever thought about that? Hazard guess? Twenty-seven thousand one hundred fifty-four, right? So if you're throwing a third of an inch off a day, that's nine thousand, right? You got a crop out there that's one hundred and twenty thousand plants. They're using a cup of water every day. So if you take these daily values and sum them over the course of the season, you get a cumulative curve that's called cumulative water use, and it shows up like this, where the soybeans here planted in 2006 at Lincoln, planted on April, March, May 8th. Sum up those daily values, it starts out pretty slow, and then it starts rising pretty quickly when they're throwing off a third of an inch a day until at the end of the season you're going to be using about, in that season you used about 19 inches to produce an 85 bushel crop, bushel per acre crop, okay? Here's what Mother Nature delivers in a historical average. She usually provides more water than the crop uses early in the season. So you, if you're an irrigator, you really shouldn't be irrigating in, in June on soybeans at all. But later on as you get here to the Reproductive phase R3, there's a switchover, crossover point where the crop starts using more water than historically Mother Nature delivers. Now we have a new website called Soy Water. How many have tried it yet? Okay, at least one of you. Okay. Here's the here's the uh, URL, but all you need to do is Google UNL Soy Water, and it's the very first item that comes up because so many people are using it. First thing that'll pop up after you register. Soil water needs to know your field. They can only manage the computers are dumb. Humans have to supply them with knowledge, right? <laughs> so what you have to do is we have a Google map in there that you can type in your home mailing address if the, if the center pivot's nearby or a city road address if you're a consultant and you're doing this for a farmer, you can type that in. But what pops up is a Google map and all you have to do is click where your field is and light up an orange balloon there. That'll generate the GPS coordinates for that field. Then, soy water is smart enough to figure out what you're telling it, okay? And so it will search for the nearest weather station when they do that. And the reason we need a weather station is we need to compute daily solar radiation, temperature, humidity, and wind speed, because these four things determine how much water your crop's going to use. So we give you a way to identify the field. You can call it the Smith Center Pivot 5, so you can put in a some name, and you know, if I have a list of 20 fields and they're all numbered, I have to have a translation table, but if you give it a name, it's a lot easier to find, okay? 
We'll come back to this one in a minute. The only thing that we need for your crop then, because in insulate water is a soy sim program that tells you that on, the, on each calendar date what you can predict for the vegetative and reproductive stage of your crop. So what we need is a planting date or emergence date. If you're planting very early, emergence date is preferred because soy sim just uses air temperatures and soil temperatures to control the rate of germination emergence in cold no-till soils. Then we need your maturity group. Knowing this, soil water can calculate for every day of the season where your crop's going to be and how much water it's going to use based on historical records and then up-to-date records from based on yesterday at midnight. Okay. Why do we need to know the soil type when we're dealing with water? Why is soil type important? How much water it can hold? Water holding capacity. Excellent. Soil water provides you a, a Google map of the soil database. So if you don't know the soil type of your farmer's field or if you're a farmer here in your field, you just go down the page and look and you can see in this East Campus field, it's, these yellow lines separate the different soil types and map units. What we're looking for is just the last three things or last two things, not the first name, the soil texture, silty clay loam. So we know this field is a silty clay loam. We go back to here, we can enter that silty clay loam. There's a list of about 20 choices here, soil water. Okay. So basically, one, two, three, four, that's all you need to, for soil water to get started on each of the fields you got. And once you enter that information, you get this, it's a table, it shows all your information up there, what the weather station is and what you entered here. You choose your trigger point for your depletion. If you're a conservative, you want to trigger an irrigation whenever you've depleted 35% of your plant available water, or you can change this to 50. And you don't, don't have to just start at the beginning, so you need to change it in the middle of the season too to see what happens, so it's very flexible. The table comes out, shows you all the calendar dates for this crop, this field, this planting date, this maturity group. And it shows you what the prediction is for your V number stage, that's the number of nodes you have, and when the R stage is going to be. R3 is a critical one. Remember that crossover point that we had down here? You can see that's predicted. And this is updated continually. The bottom line over here, this tracks how much the crop is depleted from your top three feet. It's just like a checkbook. Deposits are rain and your irrigation. Withdrawals are every day the crop withdraws whatever it withdrew that day. Now, this is pictures for these two strips were taken just a few days after the summer solstice of 2003 and 2004. The summer solstice is the longest day of the year, right? Around here it's about 15 hours and 10 minutes on June 21st. Okay? These were the planting dates, late April, early May, mid-May, late May, early June, or, or mid-June. I'll just refer to those as early May, mid-May, late May, and mid-June, okay? So what do you see as you go from here to here? What's the first thing that catches your eye after I told you you want to manage sunlight for your crop? What's the first thing you see there as you go from left to right? Round! Round! No green! <laughs> What catches sunlight that produces food? Not the ground. You have to have chlorophyll out there to capture that sunlight, right? So these guys here almost filled the canopy. These guys are closed the canopy. I want your soybeans green to the eye by the 4th of July, right? Because the more sunlight you capture, the more yields you're going to make. That's managing life. From the time the soybeans get to this stage, everybody recognize this stage. You have two cotyledons, two unifoliates, and one first trifoliate just on roll. From this point forward, you get 3.7 nodes, or one node every 3.7 days. You can kick that plant with a stick, you can kick it, you can stress the hell out of it, irrigate the hell out of it, give it all the sunshine it needs, it won't make any difference. One new node every 3.7 days. Period! So now go back to this planting date. If I can position this thing early in the season with this, I get my nodes started early on that 3.7 day crane, right? These guys have to wait a little bit until this appears, and then they start theirs. But at 3.7 nodes per or 3.7 days per node, you think these guys are ever going to catch up with these guys? No way. What does that amount to in that first season? Over here at the end of the season. At 21 nodes for this one, 
19 for this one, 17 for that one, and 15 for that. This is from 14 different varieties right away. What does that mean on bushels per acre? That's the bottom line, right? Plot those two, this is from the same experiment we had. This was demo plots, but we had the same experiment. But you see, in a bad year, I say a bad year, cold early, hot middle, cold late, the change in yield as you went after many one was about a quarter bushel per acre per, per day. For every day you don't have soybeans in the ground in May 1 in a bad year, it's costing you a quarter bushel per acre per day. In a good year, if one's coming on its way, remember you're making this decision early, like 2004, five-eighths of a bushel per acre per day. What does that mean in dollars? Well, when I prepared the slide, the, uh, the soybean prices were $8. Now they're 13 some plus, right? Quarter bushel a day when it's $8, that means for every day you don't have soybeans in the ground by May 1, pull a Jeffersonian $2 bill out of your pocket and burn it! That's an opportunity cost, right? You lost that opportunity. And that's for every acre. $2 for, for every acre you don't have the ground in a bad year. In a great year, five eighths, that's a Lincoln $5 bill that you're going to take out of your pocket and burn, right? But what we're doing is using a let's say a minus one approach with this trial or a omission trial where we have a full set of package practices that we think could contribute to higher yields practices we wouldn't normally use we don't find, haven't found them to be economical but looking at them together and then for each treatment then we drop one of them <clears throat> and keep the others in place so one of those is starter nitrogen now Generally, our results have shown that for this latitude and further south uh, in this elevation that there's no response to starter nitrogen work done here in other states. Foliar application, a lot of interest in it, a lot of results from research done here as well as in other states showing it's really not very promising. If you're doing a good job of managing, managing your soil fertility, you're not likely to get a response here. Another is to break apical dominance, and Jim can spec speak more on this. There's a history of this. It's not a new idea. People have been studying it for decades, not really finding the benefit, but the idea is to get more branching and more nodes for the, that pod set. Uh, seed inoculation using Optimize 400 is another. And again, you know, we do trials, we don't get a response. Lots and lots of trials have been done, or false responses. Doesn't cost much. High value soybeans, you know, it's an ins you can put it on as an insurance thing. But with the typical corn soybean rotation, um, you know, generally we don't expect a response. Another treatment is an, what they call it's, they claim as an antioxidant treatment, BioForge. Now, it, BioForge is one of those products where you can't get much information on it. You really don't know what you're dealing with. Um, it's um, one of those things that you know fall under any regulations. They're not required to port, report much detail, but it's intended to improve the seeds, the plants' uh, tolerance to different types of stress. But generally speaking, if you're doing a good job of management uh, of your corn soybean rotation, which is the dominant rotation in this state, you should average about 3.25 bushels per acre of corn for every one bushel of soybean you produce. Okay. And the reason for that is corn has the, the most modern photosynthesis, or most evolutionarily advanced photosystem that was ever developed for, photosy for photosynthesis. Corn has the old one. Corn, of course, you feed nitrogen. Soybean has to do it on its own by scavenging nitrate and do nitrogen fixation itself. And corn, at the end of the season, you get a bag of flour, right? Good for ethanol production, but from soybeans you get protein and lipid, which are a lot more expensive for the plant to produce using solar energy. So this is a physiological ratio as well as one we've seen in, in the stats in the state. So.